We are in a series. I am going to uh, preach all the way through the Gospel of Mark, all 16 chapters. If y'all haven't figured that out, that's an act of faith on my part. Y'all good with that? Amen. Y'all help me out. This is Labor Day weekend, right? Now, I'm confused. Can we wear white today? <laughs> is it tomorrow we're messing up? Yeah. <laughs> we used to have the hats. Y'all remember the hats and the gloves? And, and they would wear them in defiant. Now, some people, this was like the, the Civil War. Some people say you can wear white after Labor Day. My wife is one of them. But she never wears white anyway, so I don't know. I got other friends that will tell you you're a heretic if you wear white after Labor Day. Now, just so that everybody's at ease, we had conference Wednesday night, and the nominating committee put their nominating report out, and it was approved. Is that right, Mark? It was approved, and there was no... Um, Politically correct dress committee on there. <laughs> so you're all right. So if y'all want to wear white next week, go for it. Some people may give you that funny look, but you wear it anyway. Y'all good with that? Mark chapter 1. Just trying to clear up some things before we get started. The Gospels are not just a historical recording of the events of Jesus Christ. They are much more than that. Now, I will tell you that some of them are about recording all those things. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 1, uh, he says, "...inasmuch as many have taken in hand to sit in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word, delivering them to us, it seemed good to me also," Luke says, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. That was a bold statement, wasn't it? To write to you an orderly account, most the excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. It was important that we do actually know uh, the things and ordered how they went through so that we could uh, kind of understand. But it meant much more than that. Matthew's gospel, he was very Jewish, and he wanted us to see the Christ from a very Jewish perspective. John brought us that symphony of theology. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John just brought, he, he was part of the inner three. He was right there, and he brought us some things. The last gospel to be written, he brought us some things that others did not know about. He probably didn't share too much, but before he went to heaven, he wanted to make sure that those things were, were a part of it. Mark, um, how many of y'all have favorite children? Y'all just not admitting it. Yeah, you only have one? Well, that doesn't count. Because he was also not your favorite at the same time. Chris, that's you back there. We see you. Look, Mark came later. He, uh, Paul, in his missionary journey, kind of took Mark and went with him. And y'all know that it didn't go well in the second missionary journey. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had a big fight over it, uh, whether to take Mark with them. Mark, John, Paul did not want Mark to come. So Paul and Silas went one way, and Mark and Barnabas went another way, and that's just the kind of way that it, it went. But Mark picked up with Peter later on. And they, Mark spent most of the last days of Peter's life with him. So when we come to the Gospel of Mark, we're getting a lot from the advantage point of the Apostle Peter. And he brings in a different flavor than the other Gospels. Now, everything that you're going to see here is from the anointing, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All of God's Word is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. So literally what happened was the Holy Spirit comes and, and begins to work in Mark's life to record these things down. So it's as the Holy Spirit tells it, okay? 
but it's definitely got a, a, a Peter flavor to it. And the thing is about Peter and Mark, Mark messed up because when it came to difficulties, he didn't go forward. But Peter had a little bit of that too, right? Now, Peter was bold and Peter was about going forward but he also faced the difficulties of that as well. So as Peter grew to be used as a tool in God's hands, so did Mark. So you see these things put together, and it's really the Holy Spirit unveiling the good news of Jesus Christ. Every event in the life of Jesus Christ points to his mission and his passion. So we're going to begin with it here in verse number Um, 13, actually verse number 14, it says, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee. That's where he was going to do the, the beginning of his ministry, preaching the good news, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, hear these words, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. I call this the advent. It's the the arrival of the good news. It's the beginning. So what you're going to see Mark do here is he's going to kind of just put it together in very short form. It's the beginning. Jesus came to fulfill the plan of God for salvation. And he began by preaching it. So he went to the right place and he began it. Now, there is a broad invitation for God so loved the world that he gave his only gotten, forgotten son. But there's also a personal invitation. God calls people one heart at a time. One heart at a time. It's God's voice to you and your response to him. He knows every bit of your DNA. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. He loves you completely. And he just wants you to know that you are important. So when he says this here, it's a personal thing. That's what we're going to look at today. He said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Listen, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. There is no better time than today. God meets you in the present tense always meets you in the right now. Now, he can remind you of the past, and he'll be there in the future, but he's the eternal one. No beginning, no end. So in every point in in all time, he'll always be there in the present tense. In the present tense. So when God comes and speaks, he's going to speak to you today in the right now. Now is the time. God is here. Do you remember the first time God got your attention? You remember the first time He spoke your name? Do you? I mean, I grew up in church. I tell everybody, uh, somebody said one time, they said, I've been in Sunday school for all these months, all these years. And I said, I've been in Sunday school nine months before I was born. (laughs) I, I, I grew up in church. And... I learned, you know, I wonder how many sermons I've heard. Quite a few. Some by my dad. My dad was my pastor. Some by my mom. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure whose sermons did the most work, but it's always a personal thing. He looks at you eyes to eyes, heart to heart. There's a connection there. I remember I was minding my business in the back of the church. Well, kind of. I was sitting with my girlfriend, and we began by holding pinkies. Did anybody do that? Then I got so bold, I held her whole hand. It was in revival services, and I used to pray that the preacher would preach a long time so I could hold her hand for a long time. But Gail Smith, the man that actually After World War II, when my dad came back from war, he he didn't go to church. Sundays were reading the paper. But Gail Smith loved my dad and brought him back 
to God was a tool in God's hand to bring him back to God. So dad loved Gail and and, and Gail came and preached a sermon. And it's funny, of all the sermons I ever heard, I was sitting there and it was like the spotlight from heaven. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it just beamed down on me. And, and I forgot everything else. And it was like God just came with His presence and said, I love you. Now there's some things I don't like, but I love you. And I would love to have a relationship with you. Do y'all remember the first time God came personally to you? He said, repent and believe the gospel. Right there, that's the, whole, that's the salvation story right there. It's not more complicated than that. You believe, and, 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 and a, of a process of that, you know he's, he's holy, He's good, and you are not. You repent. And you believe that what Christ did. You believe in the good news of the gospel. And you follow Him. That's what it's all about. When the weight of sin fell in my heart, it was like the weight of the world was on my shoulders. I felt like my chest was going to burst. I knew that drawing. The Bible calls it a wooing. And that's God reaching out in love and saying, let's come together. Let's be one. Let's be one. So let's watch how this is demonstrated. All right? Look in verse 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. He saw Andrew, his brother, casting an net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Now, every person's circumstance is different, but they're all the same. Now, you didn't have to be in a religious building to meet Christ. They were at the lake. They were at work. Matter of fact, with Peter and, and Andrew, I mean, they were drawing the nets. And Jesus brought the perfect illustration. Hear the call. Follow me. Now there's an action that has to happen here. They had to leave the nets. They had to leave their work. They had to leave what they were doing. And do an about face. You know, that's what the word repentance means. You're headed in this direction, right? You do an about face, you're going in this direction. They woke up that day to go to work. There was, a, there was an interruption. There was a hijacking that was happening. Jesus said, follow me. And at that point, they said, you know what? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I think I will. And they left it all behind. They go a little bit further down. Now, now Peter and Andrew are with them, and, and they see James and John. And he makes the same request. It's the same for all of us. It's God's heart to your heart, and you've got to make a decision. It's your decision to make. The work for us has already been done, except we must join Him. It's personal. He called them by name. He goes to where you are. And you know what he's asking you to do? Number two, it was inconvenient. It's always inconvenient. He comes and says, um, follow me. And the, here's what he's saying. Now, one of my greatest regrets is when the Lord called me, I put him off. Anybody else do that? I used to say, well, I'll do this, but I, I, one day I'll do this. I'll wait for it to be an important date. That way I'll remember the date. By the way, I don't remember the date. I remember the day, I don't remember the date. I, I, I'll, I used to do games. If they sing another verse to the invitation, I'll go. Anybody ever do that? My dad was the preacher. I said, if he raises his right hand, I'll go. 
How silly. How silly. And months went by. I'm very grateful that he kept calling, but he, I kept looking for it to be convenient. He doesn't wait for it to be convenient. God's timing is perfect. He's never early. He's never late. Aren't you grateful he's an on-time God? So he comes and it's inconvenient. They've got to leave their business behind. They've got, there's this tug of war of emotions that's going on. But the decision has to be made. I remember in Acts 26, Paul had been arrested and he was standing before the king and, and Agrippa. Matter of fact, Paul said, I'm grateful that I'm talking to you, Agrippa, because you know what I'm talking about. You have a great understanding of Jesus. He knew what this was about. And Paul preached the simplicity and the complexity of the gospel all in one. It's simple, but the thing comes to our heart. And Agrippa said in Acts 26, verse 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You know what the problem was? It was an open court. Everybody was there. All the other leaders were there. If Agrippa had said, Paul, you're right. I need to fall on my knees and confess my sins here in front of everyone. I need to get saved. I need to invite Jesus into my heart forevermore. Jaws would have dropped all over that place. By the way, if he had, others would have got saved that day too. Matter of fact, they may have had revival break out. If Agrippa, would, if Griff, Agrippa said yes, a lot of people, I believe, would have said yes. But he said, almost. He was weighing the cost, and he said, the cost is too high. I wonder if we'll meet Agrippa in heaven. I hope we do. I hope we do. It's personal. It's always inconvenient. And it commands a response. Let me back up two verses to verse 12. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Look what it says in verse number 18. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Look what it says in verse 20. Immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Look what it says in verse number 28. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Look what it says in verse number 31. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served him. It demands a response. When God speaks to you, you should be the most flattered person in all the world. That the God of the universe would give you his undivided attention and would one-on-one -on -one present the greatest thing that could ever be given, freedom from sin, the fullness of God, Everything that is in the nature of God, He desires to give you, but He wants a response. The word immediately there is either in the adjective or the adverb, but it's always looking to the response. And the response is, I can't say it any better, immediately. Old King James uses the word straightway. It just means right now. Right now, I heard a deacon tell me one time, he said um, he was in a service and he had been delaying the good news of Christ. He knew he needed to be saved. His wife was saved. People were praying with him. People were over and over and over, they were sharing that he needed to be saved. But he came to church one day. Now, it's different for everybody, but it's personal. It's the same for everybody. But this is what was different for him that day. He said, the Holy Spirit said, I've told you enough. Either get saved or I will withdraw my hand and it'll be over.
That'll make you shudder. One of my favorite preachers who's in heaven now was a man by the name of J. Harold Smith. And he used to preach a sermon. His most famous sermon was God's Three Deadlines. And in that sermon, he had many experiences when he was preaching when God would say to someone, this is your time, this is your day of salvation, get saved or I will draw my hand. Now in his sermon, J. Harold Smith would talk about many people who would say no, some would get up in the back of the church and stand up and openly mock him. And he said in every instance, he had, about, he had a bunch of them, I don't remember exactly how many, but God took their life within the next day. Now, God is God. He can do whatever He wants, whenever He wants, however He wants. Far be it for me to tell God how to do His business. But my deacon friend said that day in church, God told him, he said, either today or not at all. And he said, yes. He ran to the altar. I know this is 2024. Y'all listen to me. People are afraid of the altar. People are afraid of coming and getting on their face before God and getting saved. What will somebody think? What will somebody think? They'll think you're getting right. That's a good thing. You know, this is the thing about me. When I got saved, I was crying when I went down and got on my knees at the altar. And I, I really, to be, can I be honest? It was on a Sunday night, and I was looking around to see who all my friends were. But I felt like my chest was going to explode if I didn't do it. And I went down and got saved, and I was crying when I went down. But when I got saved and I stood back up, I was happy as could be that the whole church was crying. They were celebrating. Do you actually think somebody's going to come up and poke fun at you and say, Oh, you got saved today. Ha, 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 ha. You know what would happen in this building? You would get your hug, your neck hugged about a hundred and about two hundred and twenty thousand times. You would be running for the door just to try to get away from people because they're just trying to express their love to you. But Satan will say anything he needs to say. He'll tell you whatever he, he you need to hear for you to say no to Christ and yes to Satan. He'll try to get you to delay. He'll try to get you to hold off. But the Holy Spirit says immediately, immediately, it commands a response. Can I say that you don't have to get saved in church? Y'all okay with that? But some do get, in, get saved in church. Look at verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. That's a sad note. The, the scribes were the people who were the, the keepers of the Word. But when they preached the Word, there was no power. That's the scariest thought for any preacher, is if we're up here alone. When we come up here, by the way, I'm, I am trying my best to do today what he did they would come in jesus would take the word of god he would read the word of god he would amplify the word of god but he was waiting for the power from heaven to come and speak to hearts the authority is not in the preacher the authority is not in the style of the preacher the authority is not in the intellect of the preacher the authority is in the hand of god I can speak to your ears, but only God can speak to your hearts. Now, if God does this, if people come and they, they'll say different things, and they're, Rick, they kind of give you a, a sideways compliment on your preaching. I just love your preaching. I said, you just love the Word of God. Right? Because what you come for is not to hear me. Right? God forbid if we just come out of habit. But if we come because we want to get close to the fire, if that's your heart's desire, He'll light your wood. And what a day that is. How many Sundays have been wasted when we went to church and we never heard from God? But what a day it is when the Lord speaks. He took it and He preached the Word of God and they said, 
Wow, this is authority. Look what it says in, in verse number, let me, verse 27. They were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. Now that's because there was somebody there in church. Let's talk about him. Verse 23, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out saying, let us alone. That sinful nature that was inside of him, that Satan had control of him, said, said we don't want this. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet and come out of him. By the way, Mark chapter 4, when, they were, when Jesus was within the boat, he was tired and he went to sleep and the storm came up. Y'all know the story. And the, story's, the, the storm's coming up and, and everybody thinks that uh, they're going to sink, so they go wake Jesus up. Jesus said these words, Be still. Peace, be still. Literally, be quiet, shut up, I'm in control. And that, that was making the storms of life come had to obey the Word of God. Same words here. Be quiet. Peace, be still. And it moved out of the way and the Lord moved in and things got good. Isn't it awful? Awesome when somebody that you know and you loved and you prayed for gets saved. Amen. How many of you prayed your children to heaven? Praise God. How many of you are, pray are praying your grandchildren to heaven? Some of you lucky dogs are praying great grandchildren into heaven. When I go to heaven, I want to be there. Amen. I I I'm grateful I'm going to be there. Uh, I want everybody there. This is the place where God can do some amazing things. I understand in our world that coming to church is becoming non-fashionable. COVID hit, it's been different. Y'all shake your heads if you know what I'm talking about. It's been different. People are, they don't necessarily come. They watch, we have people who watch us online. I'm grateful for that. We got a lot of people who watch us online. But listen to me. I'd rather be close to the fire. You can get saved. Where are you at? There's the camera. You can get saved on your couch at home. God's Spirit can meet you there. But you can also get saved in a pew. The convenient time, the right time, is when God calls you by name. Great things can happen. Can I say one last thing? Look in verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. James and John were with them. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, his, his mother-in-law. And they took Jesus about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Come on now, just one touch will do. If it's the right touch, if it's the right hand, if you're putting your life into His hand, oh, what God can do. Exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or even think. No mind can comprehend all the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. He took her by the hand. Now, a lot of people have said, oh, this is about physical healing. It's not necessarily about physical healing. God allows physical distress. God allows the difficulties of life. We're all going to go through difficulties. We're all going to go through circumstances. You're either in a storm, you just left a storm, or you're about to walk into a storm. But it's not the size of the storm, it's the size of God. And when God meets you in your circumstances, you have one plus God is the majority, correct? God can do amazing things in the life of any person who will let Jesus be their Lord and Savior forevermore. He touched her. She got up. Now church, listen to me. Listen to me now. 
And immediately the fever left her. Look up there on the screen. What's that last sentence? Say it again. I didn't hear you. Say it good and loud. You get right with God. You let Him in. There is an energy that He places inside of all of us. And, and, and it's just like you're, you're waiting for God to say, go, sick them. And you're like, arr, arr. you're going to go. And the longer I serve Him, what? The sweeter it goes. Just one touch will do. Y'all know these words. Sing them with me. He touched me. Oh, He touched me. Come on, sing. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Ha <laughs> ha. Now, something happened and now I know He touched me. Come on. And made me whole. Anybody want to be whole? Anybody want to see your friends and your family be made whole? I mean, God saved us so we have the opportunity to serve Him. All my life, every moment I have left, 20, 30 minutes, 20, 30 years, I don't care. But when my Lord comes back, I want Him to find me serving Him. Come on. With all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. Satan wants to distract us. He wants us to get our minds on all the things that doesn't matter. He'll tell you there's a more convenient way. There's a more convenient time. There's one way, and God has a time for all of us, and we need to be about the Lord's business. Y'all hear me? Oh, but God will use the preacher. No, He'll use you. We got deacons who serve. Yeah, and He wants you too. I don't know enough. You know Jesus. That's enough. I wonder what God could do if we let Him. You think God's got plans? Jack, you think God's got plans for you? and your children, and your grandchildren, you got some greats. How many pessimists do we have in the building? Not a hand? Not one? Oh, we've got some silent pessimists. The ones that say, well, preacher, I don't know well, all right, but Jesus does. Exceedingly abundantly above. Now, I've already done more preaching than we're going to do living. But the gospel is alive and well.